You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. So we are in John chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you can open up to John chapter 4. Um, and what we're doing is we're wandering through at a, at a leisurely pace generally. Um, the, the first half of the book of John. John is divided easily into two halves. Um, you have the whole passion story, which starts in John 14-ish. Um, and then you have everything before that that leads Jesus to Jerusalem. Jesus on the pathway to the cross. And we're in that first section, and Jesus is beginning to do miracles. So he's already turned the water into wine at a wedding. He went to a wedding in Cana. They ran out of wine, which was an embarrassment for the host, an embarrassment for the bridegroom uh, and for the bride. And so what he did was he just miraculously uh, made wine from water, took regular run-of-the-mill water and turned it into the highest quality of wine possible. I was uh, joking with, uh, who was it? Josh Steiger, I guess, uh, and my daughter, Sierra. Uh, there's, there's an app called TikTok, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm not a TikTok person uh, for about a million reasons, not the least of which is I'm a 38-year-old man, okay? Um, but uh, TikTok has a thing, and basically it's just short videos that loop, and you see infinite videos, and apparently they're not all what we would call church-appropriate. Um, and so uh, I, was, I was joking with my daughter that I was going to start every service with a TikTok video on the screens here and just go find some random TikTok video. Typically, it's, you know, 14-year-old girls dancing is typically what TikTok is, I think. I believe that's what it typically is. Um, but I said I was going to make my own TikTok videos, and my first one was going to be a bottle flip. You've seen the bottle flips, right? You, you throw the water bottle off in the air, it flips up. If you have grandkids or children, you've seen this in your house attempted a million times. And kids get pretty good at it, right? They can just flip, 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 and then boom, boom, boom. And I was going to do this dressed uh, kind of as an Old Testament person, and I was going to flip the bottle, and the bottle was going to leave the screen, and then boom, a bottle of wine was going to drop on the table, and it was going to be Jesus turning water into wine. I thought that's TikTok gold. I mean, it's just gold, Jerry. But, uh, but my daughter uh, was embarrassed by the idea that I might uh, become a TikTok celebrity and then get too big for her, and so I decided that's not the way we're going to go here today, okay? Um, but Jesus does this miracle, right? No one expected him to do it, and he begins to get fame he begins to get acclamation people begin to recognize like hey this guy is different right he's already been pointed at by john the baptist that he's going to be the messiah there's already kind of this like teaching fanfare around him and then he's beginning to do miracles that no one else can do and it's noteworthy right he's beginning to get a reputation for what he can and does do he was just in uh, samaria and he was talking to a woman at a well and just supernaturally revealed everything that she'd ever done, right? T told her a whole sordid backstory back to her so that she could experience what faith felt like, stepping out into faith into this one who knows everything that she's ever done. Jesus shouldn't have been there, right? He's a Jew, and she was a Samaritan, and they were um, enemies, uh, mortal enemies. There was a great deal of hostility between their peoples, but Jesus came to save all, not just some. And so he goes to Samaria and he leads that woman and many in her town to salvation because he had what they needed. Right? Jesus has what you need today. You may not know what you're missing, but you're missing something. And I want to tell you, Jesus is the answer to the thing that's missing in your life. You aren't missing better job fulfillment. You aren't missing better friends or family members. You're not missing something out there that you can purchase or you can obtain. The thing that we feel in our hearts that, that nags at us is an emptiness that comes from not knowing Christ daily. And so Jesus comes to make himself known to the world. And after he does this miracle, we pick up in John chapter 4, starting in verse 43. And this is what uh, the author John says, recording about Jesus. He says, after the two days where he was in that town, he departed from, for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem and at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. So, so he came again 
to Cana in Galilee, the place where he did the, uh, where he had made the water into wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Okay, so, so Jesus has just spent some time in Samaria. He wanders back down to Galilee and then over uh, into this town, Cana of Galilee, uh, where he had done his first miracle. He had disciples who lived in Cana. He goes back there uh, probably to spend time with his disciples' family, right where there's a support system, <clears throat> excuse me, around him. Uh, and he goes back there, and when he gets there, the word spreads that the man who turned water into wine is back, right? And I don't know what people were looking for, but Jesus had this following that would just come to him when he would show up at places. And so he goes back to Cana, and the word begins to spread that he is back, that miracle-working man named Jesus. And in a town 20 miles away uh, called Capernaum, there was a, uh, a, a, an official, we don't know his official title, but he was someone who had some sort of responsibility, some sort of leadership in that town. And then he was an official in Capernaum, 20 miles away, and the word made it all the way 20 miles away that Jesus is here. Now, 20 miles today is not that big of a deal, right? We drive 20 miles, we live in Rockdale, Texas, we drive 20 miles and we don't think twice about it. In fact, we drive 20 miles and we're still 35 miles away from anything, right? We're like, I'm almost to something somewhere, right? One day, or we're in Taylor, and we're like, why did I go to Taylor? What was I doing going to Taylor today? Right, right, so 20 miles for us is nothing, but 20 miles uh, on foot or on horse or on donkey uh, was a little bit of a journey. It took a while to get there, but Jesus' fame was so well known that the people in the surrounding area heard he was there, and there was a man in Capernaum who had a need. Right? He had a son who was sick to the point of death. He knew there was a miracle worker in town. And so he says, I'm going to go to where that miracle working man is. And here's the, the thing I want to draw out of this passage that I want you to see from this passage. Jesus didn't go to Capernaum. Jesus didn't go to where this man was located, and this man was able just to wander out of the, out of the place and be like, hey, there you are. I see where you're at. No, Jesus came to Cana, and then they heard about him all the way over there. And the reason they heard about him, the reason they were able to hear about Jesus, is because people who had seen what Jesus could do couldn't help but share about it. Right? They couldn't help but share about what Jesus could and has already done. And as a church, if you're a believer in this room today, you have experienced the power of what Jesus can do. You've experienced what it's like to go from death to life, from hopelessness to, to, to hope, from a life of, 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 of sorrow to a life of joy. You've experienced the great reversal that comes from believing in Jesus Christ. If you haven't experienced that and you're in your, in your here today, I want you to know Jesus changes everything. And the world should hear about that from you. I remember the story in the book of Acts. It's one of my favorite miracles in the Bible. But uh, is it Peter and John? Maybe James and John. I don't want to James and John go to the temple. My wife is shaking her head no. Peter, just Peter. No one else. And John. I was close. I got it right the first time. Oh, man, my wife. There's a song, I just can't, don't have it in my head. Peter and John are going into the temple to worship. There's a man down there at the gate called Beautiful. And he can't, uh, he can't walk, he's, he's lame. He's, uh, lame is not a word that we use very often to describe people's uh, physical appearance. He, he was unable to walk. He was, a, he was a beggar, a crippled, a paralyzed man. And he was sitting on his mat and he, said, and he was calling out for, for money. Give me money, give me money, give me money. Right? And that's the only way he could survive. The way he would buy his food was that way. Uh, and, and it says that, that, that Peter fixed his eyes on the man. And at that point, the man expected to receive something from him, right? If you're driving in downtown Austin, and you're at a stoplight, and then you fix your eyes on the homeless person, right? They expect something from you in that moment, right? That's why you all do this. Right? You're just locked in, like... Knuckles hard, right? Doors locked, windows up, 
locked in. Because if you look at them, you know like they're going to come expecting something from you today. And John, Peter looked at the man, and the man expected to get something from him. And, he's, and Peter's like, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, take up your mat and walk. And immediately the man's legs were strengthened. He was healed in that moment. And he stood up and he took his mat and he walked. And then all of a sudden there was a, a commotion around him. And the, and, the, and the people in charge, the Pharisees and the, the temple leaders were upset about how that had happened. And so they go uh, to the man who's telling everyone that, that these men healed him in the name of Jesus. And they say, you're going to stop telling people about this. We've had enough of you sharing about your miraculous healing. You need to stop talking about this. And this man said, I, I don't know what you expect me to do, but I can't help but talk about the one who made my legs work. Right? I can't, uh, you, you can decide whether I'm wrong or not, but, but what I have seen and experienced in my body, I'm going to go tell the world. And if it's illegal, you arrest me because there's nothing else I can do. And that is the testimony of someone whose life was changed by the power of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer here today, you have a testimony of life change. And your testimony will lead other people to Jesus Christ. And you may not feel like your testimony is powerful. You were never crippled. You were never, uh, you know, the, the evangelists back in the day, right? They had the worst backstories, right? They were drug addicts, alcoholics in a ditch somewhere, right? Just, just murdered 17 people, and then God saved them. And you're like, man, that's a powerful testimony. I wish I had been an alcoholic and a drug addict and a murderer, and then I would have this powerful testimony. Some of your testimonies are exceedingly boring, right? You were eight years old. You were at vacation Bible school. Uh, you're, you're, you were talking to your mother after vacation Bible school and on your bed at night. You surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Or anything, I don't have this powerful testimony to share, but I'll tell you what. You went from death to life. And Jesus is taking you from death to life. And that testimony is yours. There's no arguing around it. There's no apologetics that can work around it. It is yours. It is truth. And there's nothing to take the power away from it. And if you've gone from death to life, you have a testimony, and your testimony is intended to lead other people to Jesus Christ. Jesus did a miracle in Cana. His reputation spread. And the testimony of people who would experienced Jesus led this man from 20 miles away to go seek Jesus out. He sought Jesus out to heal his son. And we continue on uh, in verse 48. The man asked Jesus to heal his son. For his son was at the point of death. And verse 48 says, So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. All right, so this man goes to Jesus, Heal my son. And then Jesus' response you know, I was talking about this with my group of guys that I work uh, with this stuff through. Like, man, he sounds almost frustrated. Right? Almost frustrated. I'm not going to put that on Jesus because I don't know if Jesus was actually frustrated. But it sounds almost frustrated. Like, he's like, hey, heal my son. And Jesus is like, unless you guys see miracles and wonders and signs, y'all are never going to believe. Right? Y'all have to see it to believe it. Right? It's a frustration because Jesus says later... And John, when he deals with the apostle Thomas, uh, right, Thomas uh, was not there when Jesus first appeared uh, after his resurrection. And the other uh, ten disciples told Thomas, oh my goodness, we've seen Jesus, he's alive. And Thomas is like, yeah, I saw him die, I saw him put in the grave, I do not believe what y'all are saying. I don't know what y'all, maybe you had too much of that can of wine, I don't know what happened to y'all, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Unless I can put my fingers in the, the holes in his hands, I can put my hand in his side where it was pierced by the spear, I won't believe. And immediately Jesus shows up like, hey, Thomas, would you, you, you want to touch and feel? Or Jesus shows up and it says, Thomas, you, you can touch and feel. He says, you believe because you've seen greater so are those who believe who have not seen. There's something about a higher quality of belief, a faith that says, I just trust what Jesus says. But some of us, we have to experience Jesus to believe in Jesus. We have a, uh, I use the term transactional faith, 
right? Our faith is not activated until we see something happen, until Jesus can do something or can meet us at our felt need, then our faith is activated. And transactional faith is a substandard faith, right? It's not the highest quality of faith. It's not our ultimate goal is that until God does what you ask of him, that you'll believe in him. Right? That's kind of an immature faith. But it's where this man was. It's where he was. He said, I need something from you. And Jesus says, you don't, you don't, and we, we're often confused, right? We think what we need is what we, what we feel. Like this guy's son is sick to the point of death. That's his need in this moment. Jesus knows that's not actually his need. He has a greater need, which is to find salvation in Christ. But this man doesn't know that. He's stuck in the present and the now, and we're there, right? We get there. Our eyes get so fixed on the problem today. You have problems today. Your friends have problems today, real issues today, and Jesus meets you where you are. You don't have to get it all fixed. You don't have to have this sort of like abundance of faith that is so uh, crazy, supernatural faith. You, sometimes Jesus just meets you exactly where you are in the brokenness of your moment, in the pain of your moment, in the sorrow that you feel. And you may not feel much else, but Jesus comes and meets you exactly where you are. See, Jesus is, is God in the flesh, and he cares for his people. And so he'll meet you where you are today. Your friends, your neighbors, those people around you who are not yet believers, right, who God has intended for them to hear the gospel from you. He has intended for them to come from death to life. Right? He, 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 he intends that for them, but they're not yet there. I want you to know Jesus will meet them where they're at. They don't have to get fixed. Sometimes we try to fix people and get them kind of like church ready. And they're like, okay, now you can come. Right? Now that we've got you, you know, sobered up. Now you can come. Now that you're cleaned up. Now that you've put away... You're kind of like weird, like sexuality, proclivities, nonsense over here. Now that we've put all that stuff away, now you can come into this holy place, right? And Jesus, like, Jesus meets you where you are. The Holy Spirit does the cleaning up. Thank God for that, right? That, that we're not responsible for cleaning ourselves up. Holy Spirit does that post-conversion. The gospel is for all. Your testimony will bring people to hear about Jesus. They'll want to hear about Jesus. If you share your testimony, they're going to want to hear about Jesus, and Jesus will meet them exactly where they are. Don't get so fixed on their actions, their activities, and their problems. Sometimes as a church, we're so kind of confronted by sin. And sin is real. It separates people from God. It is a big, stinking deal, but we're so captivated by it. Their sin. And we hold up their sin, and then we ignore our sin because our sin is ours, right? So we hold up their sin, and we point at it, and we look at this sinner, how wicked, how terrible, how awful this person is, as if that's going to help them find Jesus. Call sin out. I mean, I'm, I'm not opposed to calling sin, sin, but we need to recognize that Jesus meets sinners where they're at on the road. And you, dear Christian, should be thankful for that, because if he didn't, you never would have found grace. If Jesus didn't meet sinners in the midst of their sin, you never would have found Jesus. Because you were lost in your sin. Just as lost as the addict, just as lost as the person living in the sin in your mind that is so terrible. You were just as lost. Yet God in his wisdom came to meet you where you are. He's still in the business of meeting people where they are. And then we go on. So, so Jesus, um, the man says, just come, come to him. And Jesus said in verse 50, Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke. He just believed the word. That's a great like, testimony of faith. Jesus says, go, your son will live. It's 20 miles away. And, he, and he's like, go, your son will live. And in the Bible says, the man believed the word of Jesus. And he went on his way, verse 51, and as he was going down, 
uh, to, to, to his home, his servants met him along the way, and they told him that his son was now recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Well, it was yesterday at the seventh hour when the fever left him. And then the father knew at that moment that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in his, all of his household. And this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Okay, so, so Jesus says, go, your son will live. And this man believes. He begins to leave to walk this path. And he meets the servants along the way. And the servants say, your son is getting better. And he says, when did this happen? This is a test of his faith, by the way, right? Because if it had happened like before Jesus said that, he'd be like, oh, the medicine worked, right? Oh, we understand the medicine got to work here. Right? But it was exactly the time, the exact hour that Christ had said, your son will live, that the son began to turn the corner, his vitals began to look up, his pulse ox was back up to 100, right? everything was looking good and happy and healthy, and all of a sudden he's like, man, my son is going to live, and it happened exactly when Jesus said. And it says again that the man believed. Right? This strengthened his belief because Jesus did what he said he was going to do. In fact, the fact that Jesus is always doing what he says he's going to do should bring us closer to faith. And I love the way this faith story works. It works this way a lot in the New Testament. You know, your, your, your testimony, you tell people about Jesus. Tell people what Jesus did in your life. And you may not feel like your story is that interesting. But that testimony leads people to meet Jesus exactly where they are. God uses your testimony, boring, exciting, or somewhere in between, to meet people where they are so they can experience belief. But it doesn't stop there. This man believed, and then it says, and his household as well. Faith has this natural domino effect. Right? It has a natural domino effect, a multiplying effect. That when one person believes and their life is changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that families are changed. You know, I, was, uh, I did youth ministry for 10, 10-ish years, 10, 12 years. Uh, I did youth ministry. I loved, like, almost every bit of that time of working with teenagers. Not every moment of youth ministry did I love. But I enjoyed working with teenagers. I still enjoy uh, working with teenagers from time to time. Maybe that's why God gave me, like, five of them at once. Um, that's different, by the way. <laughs> Um, but, but, I, but I enjoyed working with teenagers. But you know where uh, I saw teenagers come to faith through my ministry. Uh, dozens, dozens, dozens of teenagers come to faith through, over the course of my ministry. Seeing them uh, walk the aisle, respond to the gospel, get baptized, begin their life with Christ. But you know what my ultimate goal always was? It was to reach the mom and the dad in the picture. Whoever was in the picture, right? Some, sometimes there was a mom only. Sometimes it was a dad only. Sometimes it was both a mom and a dad. But because I knew that if I could reach the mom or the dad in that story, that that family would change. Right? Impacting one teenager, it's a wonderful thing to see a teenager go from death to life. But if you can hit that generation above that, right, the whole family changes because it ripples out from the family. Whoever the head of the family is, it ripples out from there. You know, I'd rather see an inch of change in the parent towards their, their take on the gospel than a mile of change in the student. Because I know that inch of change in that parent has a ripple effect that changes that whole family's dynamics. Faith has a ripple effect, a domino effect, because the, the, the testimony about Jesus got out. This man heard about it, and he came, and Jesus met him where he was, and then he believed Jesus, and not just him, but his whole household. And his household, in this case, would be uh, his children, his wife, and his servants, right? He had a multitude of servants. He was a, an official, so he had a household full of people who worked for him, and salvation came to that entire household because somebody, somewhere, carried the news that there was a man named Jesus who changes things when he shows up. And that man who shared about the miracle of water turning into wine at a wedding in Cana, he had no clue what the end effect would be of his life and his work. 
He didn't know. He may not have even known that he was being an evangelist for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He himself may not have been a converted believer in what Jesus had done. But he had heard a story. He was compelled to share it. And it changed this family's life forever. Right? It wasn't a temporary fix. It wasn't all of a sudden they were living a happier life or a more affluent life. It was an eternal change where their life's destination went from death to life. What a powerful moment that is. And what we learn here is that small acts of faithfulness, just the tiniest bit of faithfulness can lead to eternal impact. Small acts of faithfulness leads to eternal impact. And you don't know where your small act of faithfulness ultimately blooms up into a harvest. You don't. Right? You don't know how many times that you've told someone that, that what, what God did in your life, or, or, or you've prayed with someone, or you've experienced uh, them in their worst time, and you sat with them through their grief as God commanded you to walk with those who mourn, to mourn with those who mourn, and you mourned alongside of them. You have no idea how those small acts of faithfulness transformed that person's life. Because we don't get to see it on this side. But I do know this, that God is faithful to continue doing big things through small acts of obedience. I've shared the story in here, uh, and I'll share it just briefly, uh, of Tom Perkinson. Tom Perkinson was my dad's boss when we moved to Houston. We were living in the Dallas area. We moved down to Houston. Uh, my dad got a, a new job down there. It was a wonderful move, uh, and Tom was my dad's boss. We, lived, uh, uh, we ended up living in, a, in, a, in Richmond, Texas. Uh, Tom lived in Sugarland, which was like one town over. Familiar with Portman County? Um, and so Tom uh, asked my dad, he said, do you go to church? And my dad said, yeah, we're Baptists. We were. We were, we were First Baptist at that. Um, I don't know if we ever went. I never went anywhere that wasn't a First Baptist church growing up. I didn't know that the other Baptist church were real, honestly. Um, <laughs> you know, I just didn't know. Um, but Tom shared, shared with my dad. He said, well, uh, I'm a deacon at First Baptist Sugarland." would love to have you come out there. And so my, my family drove past half a dozen to a dozen churches. Baptist, gospel-believing, you know, good, solid, orthodox churches uh, to go to First Baptist Sugar Land because Tom Perkinson invited my father to come out there. Tom Perkinson didn't lead my father to salvation. He didn't tell my, my father the good news of the gospel. My dad had already heard that. But it was in that church that I became a believer. It was in that church that I met my wife. It was in that church that I surrendered to the ministry. It was in that church that I was mentored by the pastor into the ministry. It was in that church that I formed lasting relationships to form me, spiritually form me, for the, for the path that was in front of me. It was in that church that I was ordained to ministry, that I was licensed to ministry, that I was called to ministry, that God used that place, those people, that environment, and the only reason we ended up there, and not at Pecan Grove Baptist Church, the Baptist Church just outside of my neighborhood, First Baptist Church Richmond, the church that I ended up serving as youth pastor at years later, um, First Baptist Rosenberg, or any of the other random Baptist churches that were closer to my house, is because Tom Perkinson said, hey, Lewis, why don't you come uh, out to my church? We'd love to have you there. And my dad, knowing that going to church with his boss probably wouldn't be a bad thing, went out there. It was the exact place that God wanted my family to be to impact me with the gospel. And that small act of obedience changed the trajectory of my life, of my family's life, and of every single church that I have ministered in since then. The ripple effect of one act of obedience, one time of sharing your testimony where God is impacting your life, can change generations. And it may not look that way, but I guarantee Tom Perkinson at church right now somewhere is not like, I'm responsible for Matt Higginbotham's ministry. I guarantee it. I, I, I'm not positive he knows it. Right? Because he just, he just invited someone to church with him. Once upon a time. 30 years ago now. Come to church. Love to have you there. Changed my life. There are 
millions of decisions you make every day. Conversations you have, thoughts that you ponder on, opportunities that God places before you. I want you to know that God is wanting you to share your testimony in the midst of those. And it can be your actual testimony. I'm going to give you just a brief understanding of how to share your testimony. Your testimony is what God has done in your life. So it starts with before God. And that could be young for you, or it could be like me. My testimony began. Or I, got, I met Jesus when I was 15. Anything before 15 is before. Who you were before God. Lost. All right, if you were struggling in sin, whatever. But don't major on that because that's not the big deal. The big deal is what Jesus did on that moment, right? When he came in and gave you life, peace, joy, eternity. And you share about how Christ came and changed your life, how God God sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, and how you believed on that word at such and such age, at such and such place, at such and such time. And because you believed on that word, your life trajectory has changed. So you have your before You have the moment of conversion where you understand the gospel and you have your after. And now I, boom, boom, boom. How did your life change from before? And it doesn't have to be the most dramatic, monumental thing, but your life trajectory since then. That you eat, sleep, breathe the gospel. That what God has done in your life changes how you prioritize what you do. All of those things you lay out. You put them out there. And people need to hear that. And you may not feel like your testimony is very powerful. My testimony is not the most powerful testimony on earth. I grew up in church. I was 15 years old. I got saved on the pew where my wife is sitting now. Thank you for sitting there, baby. I got saved right there. Evangelist. Shared the gospel. Millionth time I had heard it. My parents had told me. My my Sunday school teachers had told me. uh, My RA leaders had told me. That was a thing. I like to throw that out there sometimes because I want people to know I'm a real Baptist, but I'm not one of these fake Baptists out there, okay? I was an RA once upon a time, right? They all told me, but it didn't penetrate my heart until I was 15 years old, and then something happened. Boom, the dam broke. And the Holy Spirit changed my life. And I was different. Well, was it immediate? Did I, did I stop cussing immediately? Did I stop... You know, thinking lustful thoughts immediately. Did I, my world, you know, was it all of a sudden sunshine and roses immediately? No, but God, in that moment, my life trajectory changed. Where I was going was no longer where I was going. Right? Everything changed in that moment. People need to hear your testimony, and they need it from you. And so I'm going to ask you today, I'm going to beg you today to take those small steps of faithfulness. Inviting people to church, right? Telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. Because God uses those tiny acts to change everything around you. You know, and, I'm, uh, and, and have those people that you're praying for. There's a guy that God has put in my life multiple times since I've been in Rockdale. The weirdest, most random ways. He found my dogs uh, this week. This, this person, right, that I don't really know. I came acquainted with by canvassing at Feed Rockdale. And he didn't, he's not a Feed Rockdale family. They didn't, they didn't need Feed Rockdale. I prayed with him, run into him at football games, see him at restaurants, see him at Walmart, talk to him every time I see him. There's something about it, right? Something inside of me. And so I prayed for him. He found my dog. I mean, out of all the people in Rockdale, my dogs get out, by the way. If you see my dogs get out, just, just grab a hold of them and we'll get them eventually. Right? He had my dogs. He called me up, sweetest guy on earth. He didn't know who I was. Sweet, 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 sweet. Very kind, generous. Oh, we've got him. Don't worry about it. I was in college station. Don't worry about it. We got it. We got it. We'll be up when you, we will stay up till you get here. Don't worry about it. Go get my dogs. He opens the door. I'm like, you're my guy. You're the guy. Right? You're it. You're him. Right? So he gives me a hug. He's like, hey, man. I'm like, hey, that's my guy. And God just keeps bringing him back. Right? That's not coincidence. It's God working in our lives to do something. Guys, God is working in this world today, and he's working through you. Will you let him do it? Or are you going to be stingy? Talk about the weather. Talk about the Super Bowl. Talk about work. Talk about things that matter. Jesus changes everything, and if your life has been changed, you can't help 
but to talk about him. He's bigger than the election. He's bigger than the stimulus packages. He's bigger than talk radio. He's bigger than Twitter. He's bigger than whatever problems are going on in your world right now. And he has the answer for what ails people the most. Send people to Jesus. Please send people to Jesus. You'll, you'll be amazed at what God can do. Let me pray.